Good afternoon, folks. Let's start with slide one. Uh, so what we're going to do today, uh, basically today is going to round off the formal teaching, um, as you'll find out in a moment. Um, so what I want you to do today is to talk really about two different um, areas of potential lifestyle reviews. Um, and uh, it's very frustrating. It's, it, believe it or not, this week, the 9th to 10th of March is and I'm sure you've heard this on the news, this, this, this uh, represents a year of COVID restrictions. And this time last year, in fact, on the 10th of March, hi Millie, um, the 10th of March last year, and then there were three students. Um, the 10th of March last year, your predecessors, so year two students last year, um, for some reason we couldn't go to the campus. Um, so we had a day out, we went to the Tate Modern and that was the last time that I actually went, um, that did any teaching, because I went to campus after that. Um, that's the last time that I actually went to campus, the 10th of March, 2020. Isn't that bizarre when you think about it? I think it's probably the same for you folks as well. Anyway, um, so what we're doing today, so this, so I'm getting, this is the long way of explaining. Uh, what we're going to do today is, is kind of the culmination of several classes that I did last year. Um, let's move on to slide two and that will make more sense. Um, so slide two, quite a busy slide. On the left hand side it shows the lecture and workshop schedule. Um, so I'm going to cut to the chase. So basically for week nine, so next week and the week after, week ten, the final week of term, um, I was thinking about this last week and what I could have done is, is done sport games and gaming today and art and heritage next week. But you can tell folks that there's only three of you in the class out of a total cohort, I think, of 14. And you know as well as I do that attendance hasn't been too good recently. So I'm thinking what's the best way to use that time? And I think the three of you in this room, Nicole, Annabelle uh, and Millie, um, from what I know about you and the conversations we've had, you're all pretty switched on and you're all pretty focused and all that. So I, I, so I think you're doing okay. I, I think what the other, a lot of the other students need, even though they don't really tell me this, I'm kind of deducing it, is that they need more tutorial time, which is also good for you three folks as well. So, um, so basically next week for the one hour on the Tuesday and the two hours on the Thursday and the week after for the one hour on the Tuesday and the two hours on the Thursday, I will be in Zoom available for tutorials in a sort of drop in fashion. So imagine we're on campus, imagine me being in my office on those days at those times and you can just come along, knock on the door and we can have a chat about a piece of work or life or careers or whatever you want to talk about. So those, uh, so the final two weeks folks, there will be no formal classes. Like I said, there's not really much point in some ways because people don't come. So the best way to use that time is to have it for tutorial time. So you can get way ahead of the game. Your deadline for the next piece of work is April the 16th, which is five weeks away. Five weeks away. Two of those weeks are Easter holiday. And I really recommend folks, even though we can't go anywhere, not very far anyway, that you take some time out and you have a rest because it's been a horrific year and uh, we need to rest and recuperate before the, the gates are reopened, hopefully after Easter. Um, so you, you've essentially got three weeks to work on this uh, on this um, assessment. It's quite a long way down the track, but let's make it as good as we possibly can. Incidentally, um, you will get your feedback from assessment one on March the 26th. That's when the, 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 the marks and the feedback will be released. So you'll be able to use that feedback in your uh, for assessment two, so you don't make the same mistakes. Um, so on the right hand side, so that's what the lecture schedule is going to be like from now on. So next week, Tuesday, Thursday and the Tuesday and Thursday after, I'll send a, a, an email out with the Zoom details. It will be basically um, open door tutorials, come along, bring your work, let's have a chat. And hopefully that will be the best use of that time. For those of you who've missed classes, and I know there are quite a few of you, um, on the right hand side there, top it says at the top it says catch up, make sure you catch up all of the PowerPoints and all the other lecture material, which includes examples of reviews, which includes audio um, recordings, which includes the YouTube audios, uh, it includes the PDF of, of the assessment details, it's got everything on Moodle, so make sure you catch up. Second point, if you're puzzled about the marking criteria, what you'll notice, go back to the left hand side, you'll notice that I've covered them in detail in those classes and workshops. 
week one workshop I spoke about originality I'm going to mark you on originality go to the work one week one workshop uh, to find out more about that week two class I spoke about style descriptive techniques analogies metaphors etc week four I sp spoke more about style about writing for your audience about some of the common mistakes that people make in uh, when writing uh, stylistically uh, week five was an important one workshop I spoke about structure and content and uh, two weeks ago I spoke about accuracy so if you have any doubts about how you're going to get marked go back to those classes and check out uh, what the descriptions say next point on the right make sure you read and understand the brief again like I said last week some of the assessment ones it was clear that students had not read the brief and hence they are probably going to get relatively low marks it's a fundamental fact of journalism you follow the brief and final point on this slide I said last week that what I suggest you do and I think all three of you in the room are quite bookish you do like your books so I recommend that you do one book review of 800 words and one film review remember you can't do the same as what you did in assessment one and you can't do two book or two film or whatever it might be so you need one of one thing and one of another for assessment two uh, but this class might give you a, another idea because we're going to look at different things in this class so anybody folks um, three people in the room any questions about what we're doing from now on I hope that makes sense good okay let's move on so I'm going to give you today uh, two more areas uh, of, of lifestyle reviews that you might want to consider so slide three slide three sport games and skills I've changed this slightly I've introduced the word skills which I, I think is a good option so what you can do for this one folks you can either participate in a sport or game you've never done before right so it's really important that if you play football that you don't just do a review of you playing football or if you play hockey or if you play table tennis or whatever I don't want you to do just something that you've done already um, as I'll speak about in a moment students have done this in the past and they have purposely gone out of their way to find something that they've never considered doing before um, that they've never particularly enjoyed but somehow they've motivated themselves to go and try it so something you've not done before or spectate at a sport that you've never watched before now that might be difficult with lockdown but you might be able to do it online um, so if you've never for example seen a cricket match before go and watch a cricket match now there might be a good reason why you've never seen a cricket match because you find cricket really boring but that would actually be quite a good review wouldn't it or go horse racing horse racing for people I've, I've taken horse racing over the years who've never been before they absolutely love it you know even if you don't like gambling even if you don't like horses it, it could be an interesting think about the article it could be an interesting article or this is the genius bit for today's show folks third thing that you can do learn a new skill I'll talk about that in one moment a few hints uh, computer I used to say computer games are not permitted but I realize again it's me showing my age computer games are pretty important for your generation generally so you can do computer games you can do a review of a computer game next point is really important and, and this applies particularly to computer games but also to uh, to the sports and the skills as well do something different please don't just follow the latest trend so for example do you remember when lockdown started and the the trend at the time was who was the the online fitness guy Joe Joe Wicks is that his name um, so Joe Wicks was doing the online fitness and everybody started doing it then it was all over the news and everybody was writing about how they got in touch with you know how they started their their, um, their online workouts with Joe Wicks and the, we had an overdose of Joe Wicks and fair play to him he became rich and famous as a result of it but don't just follow the latest trend yoga is another one isn't it meditation is another one these are these are all well established trend do something that that makes me go oh that's interesting surprise your reader that's what it's all about um, again this might only apply next point to um, to real life um, uh, skills and games uh, but it might apply online as well but see if you can get a free class or a free entry so for example if you were going to watch a cricket match uh, there's a big cricket ground South London in the Oval called the Oval in South London um, so you could be a little bit cheeky and drop the drop the PR office a line and say you know I've been given the job by my teacher to write a review of cricket I've never watched it before um, I'm really broke student is there any chance of a free ticket you'll be amazed how many free tickets you can get or a fashion show 
or whatever. As long as you phrase it correctly and politely and with a little bit of a smile. Um, it's quite amazing over the years how many free things I've got just by asking. Um, and also to make your article more interesting, see if you can find somebody to speak to. Um, the, a coach, you know, if you're going to learn about, I don't know, kickboxing, speak to, speak to the coach, speak to um, some of the kickboxers at the gym, uh, speak to people who've tried it, speak to some of the kids who've just tried it, speak to who's the oldest kickboxer in that gym, speak to her, 98-year-old, you know, Ethel Jones of Battersea, uh, whoever it might be. You know, so, so think about who you can talk to. It doesn't just have to be um, a personal individual mission. And when you're doing it, don't forget to take notes and use your voice recorder and take photos again if you can get out and about. Make sure that you stay safe, obviously. But th there are still options that you can do without going out, depending on what, what lockdown rule, rules tell us. Um, slide number four. So an example here, uh, some examples from the past. Um, I think I mentioned this guy before, one of your predecessors two years ago. He's very tall, Chris, um, six foot seven, which I think is in meters two foot ten or something. Um, Chris is a very tall, and he's a he's a lovely guy. He's like what you might call a gentle giant, um, but bless him, he's not very well coordinated. Uh, his his big uh, passion in life is motor racing, and he realises at six six feet seven he's probably never going to be a, a Formula One driver because they tend to be quite short, but he loves his motor racing. So we spoke about an idea for this assessment, and he said, you know what, I've never played tennis. And I was kind of surprised because I thought most people have had a go at tennis, but he's never done it. So he did his assessment too about him, one of part of his assessment too, about him and his mate learning tennis for the first time. And it was very entertaining. So quite a straightforward, commonplace sport. But the way that Chris did it, he got a good mark because uh, he, uh, he, he, he gripped the reader from start to finish. Um, another one, again, another student. Um, who'd never been ice skating and she went ice skating. There's a skating rink in West London somewhere. I forget where it is. If any of you live in West London, you might know where it is. But ice skating, again, not sure if you can do that with the lockdown restrictions. Um, a game that I know and love uh, and I've played m for many, many years is backgammon. And I, I, every year I say to the students, check out backgammon. It takes a while to get into, but you can play it online. You can learn it online and it's incredibly intellectually and stimulating and it can be quite an emotional game you know when all when you things are going really well right until the last throw of the dice and then your whole world collapses you know and the other person wins um so backgammon is a entertaining game and like i said you can play it online um another game bridge you may have heard of that a card game it's very old um i always think of bridge players as being sort of you know upper class uh you know sort of toffee nosed posh accents playing bridge in a club and drinking sherry. Uh, but it, it, it does have a, you know, a follower, a followers um, outside of that sort of social demographic, if you like. And again, you can play it online. I was going to say poker here, but I, I really shouldn't say that because God forbid that you ever get into poker and start gambling. But poker is, to be honest, my favourite game ever. Um, and it's uh, for lots of different reasons. But please don't play poker because you can lose so much money um, playing it. Uh, and also you can do computer games. Again, make sure that you don't just follow the big trend at the moment. What's the big trend at the moment? Fortnite, I think, I don't really play computer games. Fortnite, Call of Duty, or Grand Theft Auto, or Candy Crush was another one. You know, so don't go down that track. Go f find something different. Find something new and original. Uh, a computer game that's new and original. Um, so you, you have lots of um, um, a few examples there, and you you can find your own. Uh, typically, it's going to have to be online, but but it, it's an entertaining. It's an ent from my point of view, it's an entertaining read to read an article by a young student playing a game or trying to play a game that she's not done before, and it's it's very good for description and evaluation, and it, it can be very entertaining. The one I always remember, as I said, is is Big Chris's uh, story about him and his mate flailing around a tennis court in West London on a hot afternoon in April 2019. Uh, so think about other ones that you could do. This, these are just some ideas from my perspective. Um, slide five, this, was the, this is the addition that it suddenly struck me at the end of last week. This, this is a good one. And you can do them online. You can do them online. Learn a new skill. And I'm sure you know this because you are the YouTube generation, you know, but you can learn pretty much anything on YouTube, can't you? You have experts and non-experts uh, showing you how to do certain things. Something that I learned to do many years ago, 
Um, and uh, actually, I remember it distinctly. It was 1997, so way before you were born. Sorry, we've just got a very late arrival. Um, was I learned how to juggle, and it took me about an hour. And uh, believe it or not, um, I, I, the, before the internet, actually, and my mum, I don't know why, but she bought me some juggling balls, balls for Christmas. She did buy me other Christmas presents, but this was like a silly, jokey one. Uh, 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 three juggling balls, they're like sort of fabric with sort of, you know, I don't know, some kind of heavy... I don't know, they, they felt like dry peas on the inside. You've probably seen them. But there was a little um, uh, leaflet in the, with the juggling balls that explained... Um, how how to juggle. So I read the leaflet and I focused and I practiced for about an hour, hour and a half and before you know it um, I, I had basically learned to juggle. Um, so I'm sure now, 23 years later, 24 years later, that I'm sure YouTube is full of tutorials about how to juggle. Uh, as always here, be safe folks, don't use sharp objects. Use tennis balls maybe, or I was gonna say eggs, but that's probably asking for trouble. You know, but that that could be a really good article. How you learn to juggle, you know, and uh, as it says on the right hand side, practice on your friends and family. Maybe the end of your article can be like your grand performance in front of your mum and dad and your little sister. And you say, hey, folks, everybody meet up in the lounge. I'm going to show you what I've learned in the past week. And you see their completely unimpressed response to what you've done. You know, or they might be really impressed or, you know, or you might completely screw up your grand performance, you know, but that could actually be quite a good article learning to juggle. Um, something else, origami, you may have heard of this. This is the ancient Japanese art of paper folding. There are videos on YouTube. You may have done it at school. Um, I think I, I think we did it at school many years ago in the dim and distant past. Um, but it's quite amazing what you can make out of a, a simply folded piece of paper incredible precision and uh, and uh, creativity um, so maybe origami is an idea um, another one which i have personally used youtube videos for is learning card tricks i've always wanted to learn card tricks and i've had a few in my memory that go back from when i used to hang out in pubs far too much when i was young i remember a couple of blokes in pubs showing me card tricks but then i thought oh, maybe i need some more so last year two years ago I checked out card tricks on YouTube and I learned a couple more. And folks, if we ever did actually go back to normal and we could have a, a, a class in the pub, I would show you these card tricks. They are, really are quite impressive. So you could follow down my track and uh, learn a couple of card tricks or learn other sorts of magic tricks. Um, and the other one, maybe not that, um, maybe that not, not, not that original. You could maybe try and recreate a classic recipe. So follow a Jamie Oliver or Gordon Ramsay recipe um, online and uh, and then serve the meal up to your friends, family, whoever, or if it's really bad, serve it up to the dog, you know. But it, that could be kind of interesting. You, you might learn a new skill. You learn how to ch cook a, a chili. You learn how to cook a lasagna. Maybe your mum is always complaining to you that you never learn to cook. Well, there you go, mum. I'm going to go and learn to cook. That could be the story. So on the right hand side, um, as I said, think about the content of, of what this article would look like. So, you know, you might be inspired by a YouTube tutorial um, and practice, practice, practice. And then you can maybe show your friends and family, whether it's a recipe or a card trick or some origami that you've done. And what you need to do, folks, is essentially tell the story of your mission. So you started off with a desire to learn card tricks and you found this website and then you struggled because it was difficult and you kept on getting it wrong. But you practiced, practiced, practiced. And lo and behold, you showed your grandmother and uh, she was so impressed that she uh, fell over, bless her, you know, or whatever it might be. And, the, the, you know, the end of your article can essentially tell us whether it was a success or not. So that's learning a new skill. Uh, let me just move on and give you a bit more examples. So slide six. Um, so if you were writing an article about learning uh, how to play backgammon, remember, firstly, that this is more words than assessment one. So you've got a few more words to play with. You've got 800 words to play with instead of a maximum of 600. Um, if possible, you're not going to get marks for this, but just make it look like a proper piece of journalism. Uh, so take photographs, two or three photographs, you know, and try and resist the urge to do the sort of normal young person's uh, crazy, wacky, zany photograph. You know, uh, maybe a photograph of you throwing the dice and looking, focusing and concentrating or whatever. Um, and I'll jump to the bottom. I always talk about titles and stand firsts. And when I was putting this slide together, 
I, I suddenly had a, a rush of blood to the head and thought of a great title for this um, article. So backgammon, as you can see by the photograph, you, it involves counters and dice, and a double six is generally considered to be the best throw that you can get. So I would call the article Praying for a Double Six. Uh, and then the stand first, which, as you know, is a little bit more descriptive. Title is eye-catching and intriguing. The stand first is a bit more descriptive. The stand first, in my case, could be backgammon is an easy game to play, but it will take a lifetime to master. So, what, 15 words? You've kind of summed up what your article's all about. So it's really good practice um, to, to try and write titles and stand first. The third line, I say, include a box out. So if you're going down this track and you're going to do a sport... Um, or a, a skill or something, you might want to consider doing a box out, slide seven. Now a box out is there on the right hand side in grey. Let me just give it a description, the box in white on the left. You often see these in print and online articles uh, and, and what they provide is additional information. So it's all the essential information that somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps would need. So for this review, if you're doing backgammon, you need to tell the reader where, when and how he or she can do the same activity. So do a bit of research, include a place, a cost, a time, a website, Instagram feed, whatever it might be. Aim at about 70 words and try not to cram too much information in the box and just keep it really simple. So an example here for backgammon, or it might be tennis, or it might be ice skating, or it might be watching cricket in South London, or whatever it might be. So start off, bigger font. If you want to play backgammon, you can buy a backgammon set for as little as £20, but some handmade sets can cost over a 1000 That is true, folks. The handmade ones are absolutely beautiful. And if you ever want to buy me a birthday present in the future, folks, get me a handmade backgammon set. No joking, I shouldn't say that to students. But I would like one at some point. Um, alternatively, you can join a club. I've made this up. I don't think they exist, but there probably is one. The South London Backgammon Club meets every Wednesday from 7 till 10 at Battersea Church Hall. So find a backgammon club. They do exist, um, especially in London. And a, a couple of words of advice about what to do if you're a new member. New members are welcome. It costs £5 per session. Website of back, Battersea backgammon, backgammon Club. And check out the British Backgammon Society for de more details of clubs and then another website. So that's a really useful box out. And I'm sure you've seen that in, in magazines. Magazines like Vogue and uh, OK and Hello and Lifestyle magazines. Hiking magazines. I used to do a lot of work for hiking magazines. And there would be a box out that says, if you want to visit the Lake District, you know, check out these mountains, stay at these hotels, try this, try that. You know, this is the best local beer and so on. You know, so that's a box out. So as I say that, even though you're not going to get marked on it, um, because it's not in the brief, it, it is just something to consider if you're doing this type of article. <clears throat> so slide eight, some general guidance about these options. As all, this guidance is quite similar, depending on uh, bet between all the different types of reviews that you can do. Um, obviously, you need to assume that your reader has never watched the sport or done the activity. So you need some background. You don't need to explain what football is. I mean, most people will know that. Um, you might want to explain a bit about cricket if you're doing that. Tennis, most people know what it's all about. But you still need a, a little bit of something in your article just to, um, you know, mention Serena Williams or Andy Murray or whoever it might be or Wimbledon, blah, blah. You can tie that into your a narrative. Uh, don't forget that your target audience, particularly for the past 12 months, spends a lot of time online. So your article needs to encourage them to put down their phone and do something different in the real world. So think about yourselves, think about your age group. You, if you look at the data <coughs> from organisations like Ofcom, they do research on this and it is true, all those things your mum and dad say, that your generation spends a lot of time online, it's true. You know, so what you're trying to do here is to encourage your peer group to, to not spend so much time online and get out there and go and play tennis or learn backgammon or learn to juggle or learn card tricks or whatever it might be. So you need to inject that enthusiasm and energy into your article. Um, when you describe the experience, don't just think about what you did. You know, I hit the ball over the net. Think about the sights, the sounds, even the smells, you know, tennis balls smell of tennis balls you know for example uh, feelings you know the first time you played a, that you got your serve right at tennis you were elated you know you felt overjoyed or whatever it might be likewise the f i remember the first time i successfully juggled three balls i thought oh my god oh my god i've done it i still remember it now it's quite a 
feeling of an achievement when you get three balls flying around in front of your eyes at the same time. It's almost in control. Uh, point four, as always, don't over-describe. Don't just say, I did this and then I did that. You need to leave room for evaluation, so you need to give qualitative statements about your experiences. Uh, use a variety of evaluative techniques, as always. Use quotes and facts to give your article substance, as always. You only have 800 words. It's quite a few more than before, but you still need to be succinct and precise. Structure, we spoke about that a few weeks ago in uh, week five, to be exact. So what would work here is a simple chronology. So a chronology, time, you know, this is where I, I started by watching a video and then I bought myself a pack of cards and then I did this and then I did that. So that kind of works quite well with your commentary and evaluation. And then, of course, as always, <clears throat> at the end, when you finish your um, uh, article, spend at least 30 minutes reading, rereading, editing and improving your article and make sure it is presented professionally and then you could submit. But I think here there's good potential, particularly doing stuff online. So YouTube videos, card tricks, you know, anything, you, you, you tell me, you go and find something that you've always wanted to do. And here's a challenge for you. Try and do something that you've always said to yourself is impossible. And, and this, you know what, people talk about confidence and lacking confidence, particularly your age group. If you want to become confident, do something that you thought was impossible. You know, climb a mountain, you know, learn to juggle, learn to speak French or what that, that's how people actually become confident by achieving stuff. <clears throat> and the more difficult the, uh, the task, the more confidence you will uh, will gain from the process. So any questions about sport, game and skills? That's the end of that little section. Is anybody enthused by it? anybody got any ideas about what you might want to do? Does that give you more options? Can anybody juggle card tricks? Tell me what, have you got any special skills, folks? No answer came the reply. Okay, let's move on. Well, actually you have. Annabelle, you speak Spanish, right? To me, that's a, that's a, that's a special skill. Annabelle, you also said you wished you could speak Greek. Maybe that could be your mission for Article 2, learning a bit of Greek. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Art and heritage. So another area of that's ripe for um, uh, exploration is art and heritage. So what you can do, slide nine, you can do a review of an art gallery or an art exhibition. So you could go like we did last year. We went to Tate Modern as a class. So you could do a review of the whole of the Tate Modern. There's a lot of stuff in there, so it's difficult to do the whole thing. Or sometimes there are specific one-off art exhibitions that might last for a week or two weeks. Some of these, incidentally, folks, are online. So you can still do this, or take this option, um, from the comfort of your own homes. Alternatively, this one might be possible now, not sure. Students can visit a museum, stately home, or an other heritage attraction. Uh, Yusuf, can you turn your microphone off, please? Um, so, so you can do um, uh, a, a museum, a stately home, or other heritage attraction. Uh, heritage attraction, you know, Tower of London. Um, or any of those, you know, fantastic. I mean, London is absolutely full of heritage attractions. Uh, stately homes, yeah, they, they do exist in London. You can't, I think you can go around Buckingham Palace. They, they, I think they charge you £25 a head or something, which is bloody cheeky when you consider how rich they are. But anyway, that's uh, me speaking as a Republican. Um, so here, there are some options. So, hints. Think about art in the broader sense of the word. When we talk about art, we typically think about paintings, but it also includes sculptures. It also includes Banksy. It also includes uh, what's called art installations. Do you remember a few years ago, Damien Hirst, who put a shark, a dead shark, in a tank of form formaldehyde and put it in an art gallery? And it was enormous news. People were discussing whether it's art or not. But art isn't just painting. It's art in the broadest possible sense. Collages are uh, 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 um, is is art you can even say fashion fashion i mean some fashion shows the fashion is so outlandish it's so abstract it probably is art you know so you can think about art in all of those different contexts um as i said a minute ago some galleries and other attractions do offer virtual tours so you could do it from the comfort of your own home nothing wrong with that obviously it's better if you can go and do it in real life and um, as always do something different so don't just go to the national portrait gallery don't go to the tower of london you know don't go to saint paul's cathedral because we've heard that a thousand times find a small art gallery of an artist that we've never heard of who's amazing 
uh, and that in that doing that you will surprise the reader uh, again like uh, last time with sport and games see if you can get a free class or free entry I think most museums and galleries are free anyway and when you get there <clears throat> find someone to talk to ideally the person who created it the artist or the curator the curator is the person who puts an exhibition together so he or she will choose the pieces and arrange them in a certain order and hang them at, in certain places. You know, there's quite a lot of thought. For an old friend of mine, actually, um, I've forgotten her name, Angela. Uh, she's a, a curator at an at art gallery in Cambridge. And, uh, and she told me about her job once. And it is, I always think it was just, you know, just put them on the wall. But there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Or the manager of, of the institution might be a good person to speak to. And obviously take notes. And, uh, and photos and as always be safe so you can do a lot of this one from the comfort of your own home okay slide 10 here's an example and it's on Moodle and we, we, we're not gonna let's not talk about this now let's not read it now but here's an example of um, a review an art review from the week magazine last year two years ago I think it's also on Moodle uh, as an image and this is about David Hockney, David Hockney exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery um, that was uh, happening last year. So that, uh, how long is that? 600 words, 500, 600 words. So this is the sort of thing that you need to do if you're going to do an art uh, review. So when you have the time, read through it, look at the language, look at how the journalists describe and evaluate and you will see catch the drift of uh, of how art reviews and you'll notice again very s similar to previous reviews in terms of description and evaluation uh, and the language that they use and the descriptive techniques and the structure and all of those other things that we've spoken about and accuracy of course they are consistent across all genre so i've been talking far too long so let's move towards a place where you can all have a bit of input now what happened last year as i said slide 11 this time last year look at that tuesday march the 10th it was uh yeah is that right yeah tuesday march the 10th last year we had a day trip to the tate modern um so if you want to read it uh, more clearly go on to moodle and it is there as a pdf which is what i'm going to do because i can't read it off my small screen here okay so this is what they did last year so so obviously I, i'm not trying to torment you here because you can't do it but you can you can follow the same approach so last year this is how i briefed the student your mission is to spend up to three hours in the gallery and make sufficient notes and take photos to write a 600 word review in class next week <clears throat> that never happened because the week after this we were all locked down so we didn't actually go to class remember your audience is 18 to 22 year old students, many of whom have never been to this gallery. Some may not have even thought about modern art. Some people, and you probably know this, some people just dismiss modern art as being crap. And, uh, it's, and it's not really a generational thing. In my experience, some young people think it's crap just as much as old people like me think it's crap. I personally quite like it. Um, so some people may not have even thought about it. So you really have to hook them and drag them in consequent with your writing consequently you need to tell the reader what sort of arts they can find at the Tate Modern describe it and give your assessment of its appeal so some hints that I gave you that, that gave your predecessors but if you go around a gallery don't look at every piece be selective what stands out so I, I think last year at the Tate Modern I must have look, looked at a hundred pieces but if I were doing this I would have chosen five and, and, and five real standout pieces and obviously that's my decision that's my assessment it might not be the same as yours but by writing the article I can justify it when you're considering art you need to spend a lot of time looking appreciating analyze the piece don't just look at something and say I don't like it and move on to the next one you know try and make sense of what the art is all about look at the shapes and the colors and the and the images and the the, the image the, the relationship between for example two figures two people on a painting what are they doing are they touching each other are they looking at each other looking away you know is one standing higher than the other is there a sort of a, a representation of, of a power relationship for example so spend some time uh, looking appreciating and analyzing and then 
right? So do that first and then read the notes. So quite often in a gallery next to the painting, for example, there will be something stuck on the wall, a couple of hundred words that describes the painting and the painter, and it tells you a little bit about what that painter was trying to do. But don't read the notes first. I, I really encourage you to make up your own mind before you look at what somebody else has written about it. But then when you've read the notes, you can blend that into your own thoughts and you can almost get a little debate going. You know, the critic says that it's a representation of colonial power, but you look at it and you don't see that at all. You might see something else. Point number four, think about the technical skill. I don't know if any of you are any good at art. I was pretty bad when I was at school. Um, yes, there are, Yusuf. I think you missed that, but you need to find them. You need to find them. Yusuf has asked, are there art exhibitions you can view online? There are, for sure. You need to find them. And surprise us, Yusuf. Don't just go to the normal galleries. Go and find a local one close to where you live, maybe. Uh, so think about the technical skills. What I mean by this is, is, the, is the ability of holding a paintbrush and applying paint, for example, or a sculpture, the ability to take a big chunk of stone that weighs more than your house and with a chisel and a hammer turn it into a beautiful um, a statue of a naked woman or a naked man or whatever. That is pretty impressive technical skill. So it's the artistry, the actual hands-on uh, ability that the artist is demonstrating. And particularly old paintings, because I read something somewhere that in like the Middle Ages they didn't have very good paint. You know, and it's something that we take for granted that paint is, does its job. But in those days, they made paint out of sort of, you know, crushed flower petals. And uh, I think red was made out of crushed beetles, you know, the, not the band, but the, the insect, the red, red insects. So it's quite remarkable what they achieved four or five hundred years ago. Cru crucial point, especially with modern art, what does the piece make you think and feel? Because art is like music. In fact, music is a type of art. Music is all about emotion, isn't it? It makes you happy, it makes you sad, it makes you regretful, it makes you angry, whatever it might be. Does it have an impact on you? And, and I can think of several pieces of art, some of which we'll discuss in a minute, that have made enormous impact on me over the years. And then if you go around the gallery, think about this. If you could take one piece of artwork home with you, what would you take? And that is the one that really stands out, isn't it? That's the piece of work that really stands out. Two more philosophical questions at the end. What does art mean to you? These are things to discuss in the pub or over a cup of coffee. Uh, we can talk about these things forever, but unfortunately today we've only got uh, 17 more minutes. Maybe we'll do more about, in fact, we'll do more about this on Friday. That's a good idea. Uh, and what is the point of art is the other uh, question that you might want to uh, ponder as well. That, I mean, that is a hugely important question, a very big question, and there's no definitive um, answer on that. OK, so let's move on. So that's what your predecessors had to do last year. Just for the last 15 minutes, folks, I, I want to get the discussion going because I have spoken too long, as always. So what I'm going to do now, uh, just for the next however many minutes left, 15 minutes, um, give you some examples of pieces of art and let, let's see what you make of them. Um, so enough from me for the minute. Slide 12, you probably recognise that. Possibly one of the most famous paintings in the world ever. Uh, Millie, what about an artist review? So for example, if they are not famous and have an Instagram page and info where they... Sh yes. Yeah, yes, you can do that, of course. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you'll get a high mark for originality. Somebody who we don't know, but you've discovered or you know about. And But don't make it a review of the person, don't, Millie. Don't make it a review of the artist. Talk about her work. I mean, obviously put something in there about the artist. Uh, but it should be you're, you're, you're reviewing the work rather than the person. OK, so slide 12. Mona Lisa painted, my goodness, 500 and how many? I can't count. 518 years ago. Now hanging in the Louvre, Paris. 77 centimetres. Use your hands to figure out how big that is. So that's what in old money is about, what, two foot six by about... Uh, 18 inches so it's about that big I'm holding my hands out so it's not a huge piece of work but my goodness that painting is famous isn't it and it's it's priceless literally priceless so tell me folks when you see that painting you've no doubt seen it before but when you see it here think about what I just the, the advice I've given you about technical skills and does the does the picture have a message tell me what you think turn your microphone on anybody 
There's no right answer here, folks. Anybody? <clears throat> Dive in. Nicole, Annabelle, Millie, Yusuf, what do you think? Tell me whether you like it. Millie? Um, I think that, like, when you look at her, it looks, like, really intense. Like, the Leonardo DiCaprio or whatever and Leonardo DiCaprio and Leonardo DiCaprio and Leonardo That's the sort of mistake I make. Good, no worries. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio, like, he, he's got this uh, technique where he can really, like... Mm, Put, a, put a, like mood into his like the, the eyes of his mm. the eyes of the people in his paintings like you look at the Mona Lisa and she looks like she's kind of like hiding something like, ah like right I, I uh, Millie can I just stop you did did you did you do art at school GCSE or A level uh, yes. Right, so I thought so, because it sounds like you've, you, you, you've got, you're quite knowledgeable about art. Now, I don't know about you, Millie, but, and everybody else, but I've heard over the years, I don't know whether it's true, but they say that if you go to the gallery, the Louvre, and you look at the painting, and it feels like her eyes are watching you no matter where you are in the room. Have you heard that? Yes, I have heard that, actually. I've never, never seen it in the life. No, I don't know whether it's true or not. Or, but you see, your your interpretation. But so, how would you describe the, the, her expression, Millie? Um, what would you say? Is she intrigued? Is she happy? Sad? Is she? What 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 does her face say to you? I'd say like suspicious, maybe. Suspicious. Um, yeah. A bit. I don't know. A bit. Uh, I don't know. Wary. I don't know. Ah, right. So she doesn't quite believe you. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Something like that. You see, I mean, I, this is the thing. I mean, there, there's no doubt, is there, that, that it's, it's a fantastic yeah. piece of work. I mean, it, it, the technical skills that Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Da Vinci had, um, his technical skills were amazing, especially, you know, 518 years ago. And don't forget, they didn't have cameras in those days. They didn't even have electricity, so he probably did this by candlelight or, you know, in the daylight in front of a window. So I don't know how long that model ha actually had to sit stationary for him to capture her likeness. But he has captured the likeness. So his technical skills are, and we know this because Leonardo da Vinci was an amazing person, scientist, architect. You know, he did so many things very well. But this is an absolute classic, isn't it? And the thing is, Millie and everybody else, this is a good painting because 500 years down the track, it's still one of the most valuable in the world. It's still one of the most famous in the world. Um, but it, it doesn't really have what you would call a deep meaning to it, like some of the other paintings we're going to look at. So this is what, what's called in art. It's, I think it's called, you might correct me here, it's called realism, right? So what Le it's before photography. So what Leonardo is trying to do is to capture her beauty. He's capturing her beauty because there are no cameras, there's no smartphones, there's no video cameras. So the only way to capture somebody's beauty in those days was to draw or to paint them. So it doesn't necessarily, in my day, I don't know, it doesn't have a deeper meaning. Um, but, but it is, uh, technically speaking, uh, an incredibly proficient piece of work, obviously. Um, the next one, this is one of my favorites. So I've actually been a bit selfish here. I've chosen five um, of my favorite paintings. Um, has anybody seen this one before? So from 1839 uh, by J.M.W. Turner. I've given, given him an extra M. It should be just J.M.W. Turner, famous British artist. Uh, Turner specialised in paintings of, of the sea. And he's done... A, uh, he was a, a subject of a movie a few years ago. Timothy Spall paid him, played him in, in, the, in the movie. Um, and again, this is before... Well, in the very early days of photography... You only had very, very basic black and white photography when this picture was taken. So Turner would have had to put his easel on the river. This is on the River Thames, this, this view, uh, and the Thames estuary. So he would have literally been there with his easel. He probably would have done a number of sketches and, and then done the painting a bit later on. But look at how he's captured the sky. You know, the, the paint, the, the colours of the sky. You know how crazy and chaotic skies are and how transient they are. So 10 minutes later, that sky would look completely different, you know? So again, um, J.M. Turner's um, technical ability is absolutely stunning. So somebody give me the, their, their assessment of this painting. Again, you can start by saying, I like it or I don't like it, and then I'm going to ask you why. But what do you see? What do you see in this painting? Anybody else? Millie, thank you for the moment. Annabelle, Yusuf, Nicole, uh, can you give us uh, your contribution? Yusuf. I think it's amazing. Um has a deeper meaning because of the book and the Battle of Trafalgar. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. D D Yusuf, D is this something that you've seen before? Are you familiar with this painting? Or if you... When I learned history at school, they talked about this painting a lot, and I just remember that. Oh, really? Oh, right. So go on, tell us that. So, the, so the, the, the big ship at the back, the, and it's called HMS Temeraire, um, so, like you say, you're absolutely right. That was at the Battle of Trafalgar. So, the Battle of Trafalgar, do you remember when that was, Yusuf? I think in 18, 1806 or 1805. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way before your time, way before my time even. But for, for those of you who don't know, Battle of Trafalgar, really important battle. Uh, Horatio Nelson, as in Nelson's column, Trafalgar Square, he and his uh, his shipmates, they beat the French and the Spanish uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, and basically that, and Napoleon was uh, the, the French president at the time. Uh, so it's a really important moment in European history. So the, the, the big ship at the back, um, uh, it, as, as Yusuf said, fought at the Battle of Trafalgar. So carry on, Yusuf. So what's happening here? So what's happening to that ship? Uh, as you said, um, they, they won their battles, so, and the, the sky uh, does a good um, job of representing that. Mm. Um, the light, the light, yeah. the light uh, uh, reflecting off the sea is just yeah. It shows a time of, of prosperity. Uh, yeah, 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 and and victorious uh, and victorious. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so go on, give me a bit more, Yusuf. So tell me about the other boat in the in the photo in the in the image. What's that all about? The other ship. It it could be it could signify. Uh, the, the other soldiers on the other group. Yeah, no, no, not not quite, not quite. The the, the, the way that I, I read about this recently, actually, and, and what it shows, so you, you've got half of it spot on, um, Yusuf, but the, the the other element to this is that dark shape uh, with with the smoke coming out of it. So, so that is essentially a tugboat, and what that's doing is that's taking the tem tem Temeraire to be broken up. Okay, so what it does is it represents the end of an era. It represents the end of sailing ships and the start of steamships. So the steamship is pulling the sailing ship towards its final resting place. So, it, so it's actually very symbolic as well. It's, it's symbolic of the, of the Industrial Revolution. So the smaller ship has got smoke coming out. It's got a steam engine, you know, so that represents the future. And if you look, it's, it's more well-defined than the, than the ship in the background. So the, the Temeraire looks a bit sort of dreamy, doesn't it? Almost like a ghost ship, you know? Yeah. So, so, that, so that gives it another dimension, doesn't it, Yusuf? It, it, it shows how incredibly powerful. So you're absolutely right about the Temeraire being part of the Battle of Trafalgar. But the bit that, you, that we need to sort of also think about is it's representing, um, you know, sort of history moving forward, you know? And you could say that, that you talk about the sky, Yusuf, but you could say, well, it's a difficult one. Is that a sunrise or is it a sunset? If it's a sunset, it could represent the sunset, the end of the of the sailing period, you know. But nice one, uh, Yusuf. It's at the National Gallery, Yusuf. If you if you want to go and see it in real life, mate, that's the place to go. And it's 91 by 122 centimetres, so it's pretty big. So it's going to be quite an impressive piece of work. Uh, are, are you a painter, Yusuf? Do you like a bit of painting? No, I'm not, I haven't. I haven't seen a lot of art. No, you haven't. No, it, it sounds. It sounds like you're interested in it, and you've got an appreciation of history, which is good. Well, maybe this class and art in general will become a bit more interesting to you. Let me give you some more examples. Thanks, Yusuf. Um, so we're going to jump forward about 100 years. Um, let me just introduce you to the painting on slide 14. This is one of my personal favourites, and believe it or not, about 20 years ago, I had a print of this. And I had it above my fireplace in the house I lived at at the time. And I, I bought it from Ikea to my total shame. Uh, but the original is uh, 127 centimetres tall and 202 metres wide. So it's a pretty impressive uh, piece of work. And it's in the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Um, now, somebody else, uh, who have we spoken to? Um, Annabelle or Nicole? Millie and Yusuf have had a go already. So Annabelle, Nicole, over to you. Tell us what you think of it. It's called Red, Yellow, Blue, <laughs> so it doesn't have a grand title like the other ones. 1925, uh, done by an artist called Vasily Kandinsky. Annabelle, what do you think? Um, yeah, I was going to say, as soon as I saw the next one, uh, when I put it up now, like on the PowerPoint, um, immediately, like on the left, there's, well, I think actually, it's quite abstract. Yes. Obviously. Yeah. Um, but I think there's quite a few kind of like silhouette spaces yeah. um, in it. Yeah. Like on the left hand side, 
I definitely can see kind of like almost like a smiley face. Yeah. Um, and a nose. Uh, I think I like this because I think you can kind of get what you want from it. Yeah. Very good. Let me just stop you. Let me just stop you, Annabelle. You're abs you're absolutely on the right track here. A word that you used early on in your description was abstract, right? So, so this is what we call generally abstract art. So the, the, the painter here isn't necessarily trying to represent reality. And, and abstract was like a movement of art, which kind of began round about this time, about 100 years ago. And the reason it began, if you think about it, it's because photography had been invented and colour photography was coming in. So artists had kind of lost that market because they could no longer make a living out of just representing reality. So that's what started the abstract movement. So artists start to get more experimental and, and they started to move away from representing reality. So you're absolutely right, Annabelle. It's abstract. And you also say you get more out of it. Annabelle, come back on. You turn your microphone on. Tell us more about that. What? So you talk about you. You can you you can see a head and a face on the, and I can see it too. And I always used to think it looks a bit like me, big nose, bald head. You know, it kind of looks a bit like me. Um, and the other thing I noticed, Annabelle, is in the in the person's head, it looks like there's a door, that yellow rectangle. Oh yeah. What do you think? What do you think? So I'm thinking. So I'm thinking all these sort of hippie concepts from the sixties, the doors of perception, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And there is something very dreamy about it. Anyway, what what about you? What what do you make of the stuff on the right hand side? It's a bit darker, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'd say that. Um, yeah, I, I was also going to say that earlier. I think the right hand side is, although the colours, kind of throughout all the colours, it has the same colours. It's got purples, yellows, yeah. kind of like blue. I do think the right hand side is uh, predominantly darker. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that is. I just, I, I really like the colours actually. So you like it? Well. Pu you like it purely from a, a colour point, and do you like the chaos of it? Because it's quite chaotic, isn't it, Annabelle? You know, is that? Yeah, but I think. What I don't know, but I think like quite a lot of abstract art is quite chaotic. Yeah. But like a plant, like a nice chaotic. Mm. <laughs> Nice chaotic. And the other thing that I noticed as well, and it's way before, way before it is invented, but sort of uh, just below the middle on the right hand side, it looks like a Ru Rubik cube, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, like, also the, it has like, I've forgotten what, I used to play piano and there's a symbol on the right hand side, bottom right. Oh yeah. Um, I've forgotten what that. Well, it's not the, that exact simple symbol, but like there's something similar. It, I, I think I know what you mean. It, I think it's called a sharp. Yeah, 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 and yeah, and I, I just get like, I'm weird because like I feel if it had a noise to it, it would be quite jazz-like. Brilliant! Oh, that's lovely, Annabelle. If Annabelle, if you do, if you do this as a review or something like it. That is exactly what you should be doing. It's 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 like the visual representation of a jazz song, you know, and and, and yeah. you know, and funnily enough, it's funny you say that because round about the ninth, same time, twenties, that's when jazz be was becoming popular, and, and jazz in many ways is like abstract music, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you yeah. know. So so there is there is a, um, a there is a, a common theme there. Millie's just made a comment. Um, apparently, Kandinsky had synesthesia that probably was literally what he was trying to portray. Oh, do, what, what is synesthesia? I don't know what synesthesia is, Millie. What is it? A, a medical condition? Tell us, Millie. It's when, um, it's when you get like mixed up with like your senses. Ah. I think. Um, so, so like when you, I think when he would like listen to music, that's what he would. So when, when you said the note, I think, oh my God, like, it's mm. really, um, that's probably like what he was thinking in his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He probably got mixed up and then yeah. that like, what you literally what you just described and about it's like it's oh, and more, yeah like the more it's weird like the more you look at it actually i'm just looking at whilst you speak like um actually many elements of it i don't know if it's just piano music that's the only music i can read but like there's like the bars which like you read the piano music of you see like the oh, yeah. straight left yeah yeah uh, bottom right and yeah. the top left yeah yeah um yeah there's actually quite a lot to do with like um notes of music yeah yeah, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. So, so this is maybe what the artist. This is what he heard, and then he put it down in as a painting. You know, maybe that's it. But but you see, I, this is why I. Okay, no worries, Nicole. See you soon. 
watch out for Nicole has to go. Um, and we're going to finish off it. Let's just finish off in a minute. Folks, if you've got the time, uh, Millie Annabelle Yusuf, let's just go through these final ones. Uh, the next painting, again, one of my personal favourites, uh, slide 15. This is The Treachery of Images, painted four years after Kandinsky's uh, uh, piece of work. A bit smaller, 60 by 81. This is in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And this is by René Magritte. You may have heard of him. You may have seen this picture before. But if anybody speaks any French at all, you might have an advantage here. But so any of you, you three, Yusuf, Millie, Annabelle, tell us what your thoughts are on this one. Start by saying whether it's good or bad or rubbish. Does it make you think? Does it stimulate you? Does it excite you in some way? I'm really not sure about this one. <laughs> Why is that, Yusuf? It's just pretty, I don't, I don't know, it's just a plain kind of picture. It's just a um, pipe. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand French as well. So. Ah, right. I, I, okay, let, let's, just, let, let's just put that on hold for one minute. When we explain it, Yusuf, you might, you might uh, change your opinion. You never know. Millie or Annabelle, do you speak enough French? Annabelle, Spanish is similar to French, right? You can probably work that out. What does it mean? Yeah, I was just looking. I no. <laughs> <laughs> Millie, do you know what it means? Millie said, "I don't want a pipe." No, <laughs> you're not far off. What what it means, right? What it means is this is not a pipe. Ceci means <laughs> Ceci means this. Nepa means not. Un peep is a pipe. So what the artist has done is he's draw painted a pipe, and then underneath it. He said, "This is not a pipe." So, so what do you think? So, what do you think the artist is trying to say here? Uh, not, not everything is. I don't know, like a, I don't know, a metaphor for. Go on. Not everything. <laughs> not, like you know, there is a famous metaphor. I can't. I don't know what it is, but it's something basically saying not everything is as you see it. Like yes. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely spot on. And I, I sometimes use this when I give classes to my MAs about public relations. I sometimes use this picture because public relations is all about image and reality. So what the artist is saying is this is not a pipe. And he's absolutely right because it's not a pipe. It, a pipe is something you can pick up and smoke and put in your mouth, right? So this isn't a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. But at the same time, most people would say, well, it is a pipe because it looks like a pipe. So, so this this school of art, if you like, this type of art is so. If if Kandinsky was all about abstract, then Magritte is all about what's called surrealism. Surrealism. It's like a dreamy sort of. Um, it's kind of an out there place, you know. There isn't real life. It's kind of related to real life, but it's not the same thing. And I I love this image just because I just think it's incredibly cheeky. And you have to think about it in the in the year that it was painted in 1929. This was really radical stuff. This was really radical stuff because most paintings at the time were you know, were not surrealism. They were realism. They were a picture of the House of Commons that looked just like the House of Commons. So here's this crazy Belgian artist called René Magritte who does a picture of a pipe and says it's not a pipe, you know. So I, I find this one particularly um, stimulating. And if I if I had the money, I would uh, go to the L.A. County Museum of Art and buy it and put it on my wall because I absolutely love this one. Right. Two more quick ones before we finish. Slide 16. You might be familiar with this one. This is uh, the famous My Bed 1998 by the famous um, artist Tracy Emin. You may be familiar with this. So art, as I said, doesn't need to be a painting. It doesn't need to be a sculpture. It can be what's called an installation. So this is an installation. And this literally is how it looked when it was unveiled in 1998. So this is literally Tracy Emin's bed. She was going through a very difficult period at the time, apparently. And she realised, I read about that this morning, that she spent all of her time in bed drinking alcohol is a very unhealthy life and uh, smoking cigarettes and her sheets were stained with bodily fluids and various other things and uh, she actually had the audacity 
to say this is a piece of art and people somebody bought it Charles Saatchi bought it for I think 150,000 pounds I wish I could get 150,000 pounds for my bed or your bed folks you know yeah exactly Millie but you see this is still art Millie it's not my style but I do admire Trace's audacity and uh, again I read a quote this morning about this and uh, somebody, one of the criticisms was, well, this is just a bed. It's not a piece of art. Anybody can do that. And Tracy's response was, yeah, but not everybody has done it. So she gets a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of credit in my mind for just having the sheer balls to do it, basically. Even though, to me, it's not a very attractive um, exhibit and it's not uh, very... Um, it's not the sort of thing you can put on your wall at home or have at home. It, it's kind of, for me, this is kind of losing the point of what art is supposed to be. But it's still art. And there are other examples of more recent work like this. And last but not least, 17. So this is possibly the world's most famous artist at the moment. This is Banksy. And nobody knows who he is still, or she is, could be a she. This is a 100 uh, centimetres square. Annabelle really likes it. Go on, Annabelle, tell us, what do you see? What do you see? What's it saying? Does this one have a message? Because Tracy's bed has got a message. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like, I definitely say this has a message. Go um, on. Obviously, it was created in 2020. Oh. Um, so very, very recent. And obviously, well, I would say it's, it's pretty clear it's to do with the pandemic. Yeah. What makes you say that, um, Annabelle? What makes you say that? Well, probably the child with the doll who is in there. Yeah who is in his kind of like box of superheroes yes yeah um and i just think it's it's like mainly about like younger generation the generation beneath us and how really like that's how they kind of it's really sad like that's how they look at life now like oh right like, yeah, yeah, so, oh i see i, I was surprised that it's, not, it's, not, it's not sad like obviously it's really lovely that yeah this nurse is in the same box as kind of bad that man and whoever yeah but um it's sad in a way at the same time yeah like yeah yeah, yeah. it has i think the word i, word, like I, th I think the, the the word a good word to use here annabelle would be pathos you know that's a greek word right pathos p-a-t-h-o-s yeah. um, and i i think it has pathos it, and it, it is pathos is not really sadness but it, it it makes you think in a sort of it makes you think in a way that doesn't make you smile it's very, it's very, it's very, yeah. it's very, what's the word? There is a classic word. It will come to me in a moment. It, it's, um, but it, it certainly makes you ponder. And like you say, it, you know, in, in, in the child's uh, toy box, you've got Batman and Spider-Man and the other one he's pulled out is a nurse and she's got a fist up, you know, just like and a cape, right? Just like Batman flying through the sky or Superman or whoever it might be. Um, so on that level, it's all about superheroes. So our nurses, our medical staff, and it's like you say, it's very much of its time. It's definitely a pandemic picture. And, um, you know, and he's sort of combining realism because it does look like a little boy. He's combining realism with surrealism, you know. So, so uh, Banks, Banksy is, is, is quite incredible, really. So the, the, the point I've, I've done there, just through those last six slides, We've gone through 500 years of art. I've chosen five that I really like. Um, so you, you could do something similar and discuss them in a similar way. Um, so Yusuf, you ask if there's online exhibitions. There are, but you need to go out and find them. Uh, but follow my guidance on this. And, um, and, and, and you never know, this could be a good alternative to one of your assessment twos. Let's just finish off. We've gone 10 minutes over, folks, but hopefully it's been useful and fun. And if we were in a real class, you see, if we were in a gallery, we could do this much more in a human way. So slide 18 for Thursday's workshop. This is what I want you to do, folks. Think about art that has stimulated you. So it doesn't matter how it's stimulated, but really for art to be successful, it needs to stimulate you. So it should either make you impressed by their technique, their ability of using pen uh, or paper and, and uh, a paintbrush and paint uh, to represent what they believe or think or imagine or can see. And think about how it's stimulated. It can stimulate your mind. It can make you think. It can stimulate your heart. It can generate feelings of emotion, of love or loss or regret or whatever. And also, even deeper than the heart, it could stimulate something in your soul as well. And that's what the really best art does, whether it's music or a painting or a statue or a sculpture or whatever. So it's completely up to you very subjective these are five six paintings that i really like well with the exception of tracy's bed not sure that i like that but i do admire it 
Um, so think about your own. Think about what you learnt at school. You stuff. You think about sort of historical pictures if that's your thing. Uh, Millie, you've had a bit of art training in the past. Think about what you did, studied years ago. And Annabelle, j again, just think about whatever it is that you like and see if you can find which galleries they live in and maybe you could do a review of that gallery. Okay, folks, I hope that's been useful. Sorry to have gone over time, but I think it was fun to discuss these things. So you, need, you know what you need to do for Thursday. Um, so think about art and I'll give you an exercise to do on Thursday that involves writing about art. Uh, possibly about sport and games as well. I haven't decided yet. So any questions before we go? Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, any questions? You're okay, Millie? You're okay, Yusuf? Yeah. Good. Okay, so have a ponder. I'll put the recording up when I get a chance. Thanks, folks.